Hello, and welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is breast carcinoma risk factors. In this video, I will discuss the risk factors for developing invasive carcinoma of the breast with a focus on non-proliferative and proliferative lesions and their associated risk. Now, the risks that I'm going to talk about uh, are biological, uh, but also uh, have some lifestyle, environmental, and cultural uh, factors as well. Now, the number one risk factor is going to be female sex. About 99% of breast cancers arise in females. Risk also increases with age. Breast cancer is not typically seen in the very young. Risk also increases with increasing lifetime exposure to estrogen, because estrogen increases proliferative stimuli, which it can do through a couple of pathways. One is through direct stimulation of growth factors, such as transforming growth factor alpha and fibroblast growth factor, and this can occur in a paracrine effect where the cell that secretes estrogen is affecting nearby cells, or it can be an autocrine effect where the cell that secretes estrogen uh, has the estrogen feedback and stimulate itself. And estrogen regulates many, many genes through the estrogen receptor, and some of these are relevant for tumor growth. Now, in familial breast cancer, uh, we get germline mutations with high penetrance, such as BRCA1 and BRCA2 and TP53. I will discuss these in more detail uh, in the uh, next video, which is on uh, breast cancer pathogenesis. Strong family history uh, is also associated with increased risk. In the next slide, I'll describe what a strong family history is. And in addition, we have lifestyle and environmental factors. So for example, we know that high alcohol consumption increases risk. It's thought that this is because uh, this increases uh, estrogen uh, in the body. In addition, uh, decreased risk is seen with uh, pregnancy before the age of 20 years and with breastfeeding. Uh, this is going to uh, decrease uh, the uh, lifetime exposure to estrogen. And then we have our epithelial breast lesions. More on that in a moment. So this is a table that I've uh, modified from Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology, Table 17.8. Uh, we have here uh, the relative risk associated with a variety of factors. Uh, relative risk is uh, considered when compared to an individual who does not have any of these risk factors. So we have uh, these top ones here, uh, which are a risk of greater than 4. We have an intermediate group with a relative risk of 2.1 to 4. And then we have a category here, which has a fairly uh, low increase in relative risk. Now, the ones I've highlighted here in blue are associated uh, with increased lifetime exposure to estrogen, and these uh, two in yellow are the ones that I'll be focusing on uh, in the rest of this talk. Now, as we uh, look at this, uh, as I already mentioned, female sex is uh, very strongly associated with breast carcinoma. The strong family history is when you have more than one first-degree relative or someone who develops breast cancer at a young age or has multiple cancers. A personal history of breast cancer is also associated uh, with an increased uh, risk of invasive cancer uh, developing again. And then high breast density, which is thought to be secondary to increased estrogen, also uh, increases one's relative risk. And then we have our proliferative disease with atypia. More on that in a moment. So in addition to these germline mutations of high penetrance, such as BRCA1 and 2, we have some with moderate penetrance, such as CHECK2. And I'll describe these more in the next video. High-dose radiation to the chest at a young age, or one first-degree relative uh, with breast cancer does increase relative risk. And then here we have a uh, slight increase in relative risk. Uh, all of these are associated with uh, increased exposure to estrogen. Uh, so early menarche and late menopause increase lifetime exposure. Uh, nulliparity, because of the break in estrogen uh, levels that we get uh, during pregnancy, uh, as well as during breastfeeding. Exogenous hormone therapy is going to increase uh, the uh, estrogen that the body's exposed to. And as you're aware, uh, we get peripheral conversion uh, of uh, testosterone to estrogen in uh, fat tissue, which can lead to increased estrogen. And it's believed, as I've mentioned, that high alcohol consumption, as well as physical inactivity, are associated with increased uh, estrogen. Uh, now let's take a look uh, at these uh, two here in yellow, our proliferative disease with and without atypia. So I need to make an important distinction here. So we have these epithelial breast lesions and they're associated with a range of relative risk of invasive carcinoma. Uh, Non-proliferative breast changes uh, have no increase uh, in relative risk, whereas proliferative disease without atypia has a mild increase. 
proliferative disease with atypia has a more significant increase. And then the greatest uh, risk of invasive carcinoma comes with carcinoma in situ. Now, I'm only going to discuss these three in this video. Carcinoma in situ will be discussed in the pathogenesis of carcinoma uh, video. Now, the distinction I have to make here is for you to recognize that these are the names of categories. And there are certain entities that are associated with each of these categories. When we say something is non-proliferative breast change, that doesn't mean that there's not any proliferation because uh, all tissues actually show some proliferation. So don't get confused by the name. Just recognize which entities that are associated with each category. Let's begin with our non-proliferative breast changes. So those are going to be uh, uh, characterized by a single layer of epithelial cells and no increased uh, risk of malignancy. Now, they typically have a single layer of epithelial cells, but they can have a little bit more. Don't be fooled. This is because there can be a little bit of proliferation, particularly in the context of apocrine metaplasia. So the two uh, lesions that are associated with non-proliferative uh, breast lesions are cysts and adenosis. So cysts may present as a mass. You can recognize them uh, through ultrasound, that they are filled with fluid. Or if you have a cytopathologist who's doing a fine needle aspirate, the mass will collapse uh, when aspirated. Some associated findings that we see with cysts are, as I mentioned, apocrine metaplasia. What we see is that in these lining uh, luminal cells, that they will develop this abundant pink granular cytoplasm, and they look like apocrine glands. Uh, we can also get uh, calcifications of the secretions within the cyst, and this can lead to a mammographic finding of calcifications. And finally, uh, cysts may rupture, leading to inflammation and fibrosis, which can cause a palpable density, which may be very worrisome. Uh, this finding is referred to uh, as fibrocystic changes. Uh, the next entity to consider is adenosis, which is increased number of asini per lobule. So increased number of asini sounds a lot like it's got a little bit of proliferation. Again, don't worry about the actual term. The important thing to keep in mind is that cysts and adenosis are associated with no increased risk of malignancy. Adenosis is typical of pregnancy and may be focal in non-pregnant people. So let's take a quick look here at these two lesions. This is a beautiful example of a cyst here, and here's a second cyst here. You can see the cyst secretions. Uh, this uh, tiny uh, duct that we see here, is lined by the typical luminal cells that are flat. Here you can see apocrine metaplasia, this abundant pink granular cytoplasm, uh, which you can also appreciate here. Now this is a needle uh, core biopsy showing adenosis. Uh, I personally think that uh, it would be, um, it's very challenging uh, to recognize and I would not uh, expect uh, any medical student to be able to look at this and say, ah yes, this is benign and not malignant. Uh, so I just want you to get an idea of what it looks like. We have an increased uh, number uh, of asini in our lobule. So you can compare this to this little one right here. Now this brings us to something which is slightly more important, which is our proliferative lesions without atypia, because now we do have a one and a half to two-fold increase in our risk of malignancy. And the four entities to consider here, and which you need to know, are epithelial hyperplasia, sclerosing adenosis, complex sclerosing lesion, and papilloma. So in epithelial hyperplasia, you have increased numbers of luminal and myoepithelial cells, so both cell types, and these are going to fill and distend the ducts and lobules, and they're going to be characterized by irregular lumens. In sclerosing adenosis, we have increased number of asini, but in contrast to what we saw in regular adenosis, they are compressed and distorted by fibrosis. Uh, the next lesion is called complex sclerosing lesion, and this is indeed quite complex because it can have components of sclerosing adenosis, epithelial hyperplasia, as well as papilloma. And it can mimic a carcinoma radiologically on mammogram uh, when we have a gross specimen and we excise it because it can have this very stellate, uh, serous appearance, uh, and even histologically uh, can mimic carcinoma. And within this uh, category of complex sclerosing lesion is a lesion called radial scar. And then the final entity is papilloma. Like all papillomas, it has branching fibrovascular cores lined by epithelium. In the breast, they tend to arise in ducts that they then dilate uh, due to blockage. So let's look at each of these entities, beginning with epithelial hyperplasia. So here is a normal uh, duct slash asinus, so that you can appreciate uh, the myoepithelial cells here, and then this layer of luminal cells here. So we have two cell layers. 
In epithelial hyperplasia, we have proliferation of both of these cell types. If we were to stain this with immunohistochemistry, we would be able to recognize both myoepithelial cells as well as our epithelial cells. And you can appreciate here uh, that in contrast to this nice punched out uh, lumen here, we have these sort of crescent shapes, these irregular appearances here. Uh, this is a characteristic uh, finding in epithelial hyperplasia. Again, I don't think that this is something that uh, first and second year medical students uh, should be able to recognize. Uh, here we can see uh, two examples. This is sclerosing adenosis, which is our proliferative lesion without atypia. And I wanted you to be able to compare that to the adenosis, which is a non-proliferative lesion, which I showed you earlier. You can see here that we similarly have a uh, proliferation of our asini, but instead of being loose and open, we now have a compression with fibrosis, and this is what we call sclerosing uh, adenosis. Uh, our third lesion then is our complex sclerosing lesion, which is going to show again this fibrosis. Uh, and then we have adenosis here as well. Uh, and this certainly is forming a mass. You can see here the boundary of that mass uh, with fat here. Uh, this would be a palpable firm mass uh, and on cut section would have a gritty appearance. And then the final entity is the papilloma, which are our fibrovascular uh, cores lined by a single layer of epithelium. Uh, this is uh, one arising uh, in a small duct. You can get uh, papillomas both in uh, small ducts, and they may be multiple and deep in the breast, or they can arise in the large ducts. Uh, and about 80% of the large duct papillomas are associated with a unilateral nipple discharge, uh, which is uh, worrisome for malignancy. Uh, this can be bloody if the papilloma twists about its uh, pedicle uh, and we get a little bit of necrosis, or it may be a, a clear uh, discharge when we get blockage of this duct, which then uh, the papilloma shifts, allowing uh, discharge of fluid. Now the final uh, proliferative uh, lesion that we're going to discuss in this video is proliferative lesions with atypia. Now this is where we're moving up, four to five fold increased risk of malignancy. And there are two uh, lesions to consider, atypical ductal hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia. And the easiest way to think of these is they are not quite ductal carcinoma in situ and not quite lobular carcinoma in situ. So they look like it, but they don't have enough uh, extent. So this is only going to partially fill uh, the involved ducts, and this is only going to fill or distend about 50% of the asini of a lobule, so not the entire lobule. So let's take a look first at our atypical ductal hyperplasia. This is just a compare and contrast of our spectrum. Epithelial hyperplasia, all of these crescents, no punched out lumens. Here you can see still some crescents, and here are our punched out lumens, those, uh, this align these aligned cells. And then we see finally our ductal carcinoma in situ. The entire uh, area here is filled with these punched out lumens, no more of these uh, crescentic ones. So this is our atypical ductal hyperplasia. Again, we'll talk about DCIS more uh, in the next video. And then here uh, to look at atypical lobular hyperplasia, easiest to recognize when we compare and contrast with lobular carcinoma in situ. Both of them have identical cells, so very monomorphic, small, round cells. They're discohesive in that they don't stick uh, together very well. And you can see uh, in lobular carcinoma in situ, this entire lobule uh, is um, distended, all of the asini are descended by these cells, whereas in this atypical lobular hyperplasia, not all of them are distended, and this one uh, is actually still maintains its lumen. So these are our uh, epithelial uh, proliferations. Now I'm going to uh, take a slight detour uh, into what we typically associate when we talk about uh, invasive carcinoma. And that has to do with, well, what about race? Uh, because we uh, talk about all these different uh, biological and social and cultural features. And you will notice as you read in your textbook, there are associations uh, with uh, socially defined race. So what is that about? So the first thing to keep in mind is biological race does not exist. So there are no significant uh, biological differences across the different socially defined races. Now there are differences across populations. So if you were to look at uh, West Africans versus East Africans because of genetic drift, you can also get issues such as due to a founder effect uh, or a population bottleneck. We can definitely get differences across different populations. The important recognition is that these differences are not 
uh, associated with socially defined race. But socially defined race comes in because it has a tremendous impact on health because of access to care, exposure to toxins, etc. So with these uh, three facts in mind, we have to consider the fact that uh, it's well known that African American women are more likely to have a particular type of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer than other socially defined races. Now, triple negative breast cancer is a particularly aggressive type of breast cancer, which is characterized by lacking expression of estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and also lacking expression or amplification of HER2. Uh, so I, once more, I'll go into more detail on this in the uh, pathogenesis uh, video. Now, the fact that uh, African American women are more likely to have triple negative breast cancer has been used uh, to support the idea that there are biological differences between African American women and other socially defined races. Uh, it has also been uh, used to, to account for the increased mortality rates uh, in this population. Now, before we get to that aspect of the disparity uh, in survival, let's keep in mind that Africa has more genetic diversity uh, than anywhere else on the planet. So it's not really possible to make a genetic argument about all African American women. We also have to keep in mind that environmental and social factors have a tremendous impact on biology. Uh, Dr. Olapati, whose uh, work I'll share with you in a moment, uh, has uh, shown some, uh, it appears to be that increased stress may contribute uh, to triple negative breast cancer. And then finally, uh, we have to keep in mind that structural racism has a tremendous impact on prognosis because of diagnostic delay and adequate care. So let's look at the data from uh, one of Dr. Olapati's review uh, papers. This is showing uh, the different um, uh, socially defined races, and uh, we have an ethnicity here with Hispanic. Uh, and we can see here that this particularly aggressive type of breast cancer is more common in African Americans, much lower uh, in other socially defined uh, races uh, and ethnicity. So uh, how do we interpret these data? So one thing to keep in mind is that the majority of African Americans are the descendants of enslaved people who originated largely from Western and Sub-Saharan Africa. And so when we look uh, at rates of triple negative breast cancer in West Africa, we can see that they are higher uh, than what we see in East African women and that they are comparable uh, to what we see in African American women. So this does suggest uh, that there is a population-based difference, not, however, a uh, socially defined race-based difference. Uh, we also have to be aware of uh, social and cultural differences that may also contribute. These are very difficult to tease out the uh, contribution of these. Uh, it has to do with uh, perhaps decreased prevalence of breastfeeding, uh, earlier menarche, earlier uh, parity, and then uh, uh, waist to hip ratio. Now, what about ethnicity? So we saw there that um, for triple negative breast cancer, it appeared that there was really no significant difference uh, in the group referred to as Hispanic. Uh, however, some papers do report a higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer in Hispanic populations. Ethnicity in the United States is usually dichotomized as Hispanic, non-Hispanic. And we have to keep in mind is that there's significant heterogeneity in this ethnic group uh, because it's defined by uh, language, so Spanish speaking, uh, so it would include individuals from Spain, uh, but not include Latin Americans uh, from Brazil because they speak Portuguese. So with this in mind, let's uh, take a look at some data from the CDC looking at rates of new cancers uh, and rate of cancer deaths uh, in the female breast. And uh, the categories here are white, uh, black, uh, American Indian, Asian Pacific Islander, and uh, Hispanic, which again is an ethnicity. Uh, and there are a few things I would like to point out. One is, is that it's commonly stated uh, that breast cancer is much more common in uh, what I refer to as European Americans when compared to African Americans. That gap has narrowed. However, we can see here, if we look at the rate of cancer deaths, that uh, the highest uh, mortality is in African Americans. Uh, and so this is uh, a significant uh, issue. So what do we do with these data? We have to recognize the challenges that our patients face in access to care and be sure that we offer support uh, and resources to our patients. So uh, just to finish up uh, with a couple of questions for you to test your understanding. Uh, so what are the uh, different categories of epithelial breast lesions and how do they correspond to risk of invasive carcinoma? And what are risk factors that are associated with increased estrogen exposure?
Uh, I hope you found this useful. Uh, please put comments down below uh, and uh, follow me on Twitter. Thank you very much for your time and attention.